good evening. The Lord be with you as we move through this second week of Lent, and we remember that Lent is a movement. The whole season is intentional movement toward Christ, not only toward the important days of commemoration of his cross and resurrection, but both of those point to new realities that are available to us through Christ. And so we move toward the risen Christ, who is also the loving, forgiving, ruling, truth-telling, liberating, healing presence of God at work in our lives for all who believe, for all who desire him. Uh, all of these resources available in Lent is a time of when we when we lean into it, when we when we lean into these truths about Jesus and and uh, move toward Him. I hope that you're finding the presence of Christ rich in your lives these days. Um, if you have a Bible tonight, I'd like for us to look at Luke chapter three. Uh, our congregation has has been reading. Um, Luke during Lent, so my reflections on these Wednesday night devotionals during that time will be about uh, some of the readings uh, that have come in the preceding uh, week. And today I want to uh, read Luke chapter 3, um, the first 18 verses or so. Uh, about John the Baptist, and I just want to share a few thoughts um, that can hopefully inspire our hearts and open our minds to Christ's work. Luke chapter 3, in the 15th year, verse 1, <coughs> in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, <coughs> excuse me, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. <clears throat> I find this passage fascinating. Please excuse me, I'm going to take a sip from my afternoon tea. which I always enjoy. I was not a tea drinker until I met Jessica, my wife, and she introduced me to the joys of tea. And I do enjoy it. <clears throat> I love how Luke, in his gospel, identifies the time period in which God began to work. Um, he does the same thing earlier in chapter 2 uh, when, when, when he goes to tell about uh, the birth of Jesus. And he mentions uh, Caesar Augustus, uh, Quirinius was governor. He, he is rooting these uh, events in history. Now, there's all sorts of controversy about these dates. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> because some of the people are not well known outside of Luke's account, or there seems to be some historical data that you know that raises the question: Did Luke get some things jumbled? Um, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on all of that, but I don't think Luke. You see, you see, we have this in in, in uh, modern day historiography there is a need to be super precise about details. Or people will think you don't have your information right. You know, this, we need to talk about 
when this happened, what date, who was there, who wasn't. Um, and it's, it's not that Luke is not concerned about details, <clears throat> but writers of history were less concerned in, in this era, were less concerned with absolute precision of every detail than they were about making some broad points. And the point that Luke is trying to make is that all of these people in leadership were in leadership at the time when John was preparing and beginning his work, whether it corresponded to the exact day and time and hour when he first spoke. That's not really his concern. He wants to put this in the general time frame when these people held power. And I think it's interesting that um, I think it's interesting that Luke gives us um, kind of layers of leadership, layers of power structure. Fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor. Herod was tetrarch. Um, Caiaphas and Annas were in the priesthood. Luke has given all of the prominent people of authority <coughs> who were in place at the time of John's ministry. Tiberius Caesar at the top, the, um, the ruler of Rome, who at this point also had taken authority over uh, the province of Judea and had extended his rule through a local governor, Pontius Pilate. All around Judea, there were a few little vassal kind of client states that had once belonged to Herod, who had kept a little bit of autonomy, but was kind of under the umbrella of Rome. When Herod died, uh, his three sons uh, kind of split up his kingdom into pieces. Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, etc. Uh, Lysanias, we don't know much about, but that, that's but but Pilate and Herod and Philip and Lysanias, these are sort of local rulers, but very much under the broad umbrella of Rome. Then you had the local ethnic leadership, religious ethnic leadership of the Jews. Uh, in the high priests, Annas and Caiaphas. And I think this, this passage serves a couple functions. One, it kind of gives us the approximate date, uh, time, probably um, some scholars think 25 to 26 AD. Um, so it gives us an approximation of when John began his ministry, but it also gives us a contrast. These are the people with power in the world. These are the people who rule the institutions. And they're all doing their thing, especially at the top, Tiberius Caesar, the most powerful man in the world at that time. The other rulers, on a more local level, uh, carried great weight in Galilee and Galilee and Judea. Annas and Caiaphas were leaders over the the, tri the, the, the ethnic and religious Jews who were without a state and without governing authority. But God's doing his own thing. <laughs> I, I'm just fascinated by this. Yes, history's rolling on. Yes, the Roman Empire is there. Yes, Herod, the local king and his legacy is there. Yes, 
uh, the high priesthood, Annas and Caiaphas, which was very much a religious, political kind of institution, um, very much concerned with political power and not just the um, helping the people to know God and worship God. Um, they're all doing their thing in the systems of this world. But the word of God came to John. The word of God came to John in the desert. The word of God comes outside the systems. The word of God will not be mediated through the halls of power. The word of God will not be wrapped around the mantles of prestige. The word of God will not be contained in those who claim religious authority to do so, who become the arbiters of how people may or may not get to God and who will use that power and control um, <clears throat> to gather some and exclude others. Instead, the Word of God comes outside the system. The Word of God comes into this world through someone who's been set apart to receive the Word of God. Comes to God in the desert, as the Word of God often comes to God's prophets, to Moses, to Elijah. Um, to others who are outside of the mainstream, who are outside of the status quo. And John has a mission from God um, that, is, that, that really finds all the power structures of the world somewhat irrelevant. Uh, his, his mission is to preach a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. His mission is to gather the people of God, not the powerful ones, the people who are scattered, who are divided, who are discouraged, who have not heard an authoritative divine word for many, many years. And John steps onto the scene, taking up the prophetic task that was given to him before birth, And begins preaching, declaring a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It is not a coincidence that he, that he does this ministry in the Jordan River. Um, true, there are not a lot of rivers in the area. But there are other ways that he could, he could have gathered around the Sea of Galilee, for example. But... John calls people to the Jordan for an unparalleled experience of washing them in the Jordan. This was, there, were, there were Jewish rituals involving uh, ceremonial cleansing. Uh, in order to be a convert to Judaism, you had to go through ritual bathings and so on. But this was different. Uh, these were not converts to Judaism. This wasn't about ritual cleansing in order to go to the temple or anything like that. This is John calling to their hearts to embrace a new beginning in God. Just as God had called the people of Israel into the promised land through the Jordan by dividing the Jordan, entering in as almost a, uh, almost a kind of baptism there, almost a kind of
former. Um, we are we are now in pothole season. And there, I was driving down the roads of Princeton the other day, and I'm like swerving around trying not to hit the potholes. I'm like, man, it's going to take the, the road crews forever to, to get these uh, things made right. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way, get out there.
only burn away that which is impure and unhelpful, but is going to draw forth that which brings life. The Holy Spirit will come and give life where there has been death. In Christian theology, we talk about regeneration. And regeneration is the divine act by which the Holy Spirit takes us from death to life. We call this new birth. We call this conversion, regeneration. When, when we are made alive after we have been dead in our trespasses and blind to the realities and goodness of God, uh, the, the Holy Spirit is going to bring that to life. But we're told that his winnowing fork is in his hand this Christ who's coming to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn and he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. There is a separating that will take place. There is going to be a gathering of those who uh, do repent, who do receive Christ, who John witnesses to. And there's going to be judgment and, um, and a separating out of those who have been opposed. And here the metaphor is burning up of the chaff with unquenchable fire. Fire is, is often a metaphor for the judgment of God that will come and um, uh, destroy, ultimately, those who are not interested in what God has to offer. And we're told in verse 18, with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. Oh, John, what, a, what an amazing prophet. He comes to us with, with a strong word. But, but, you know, sometimes we need that. Um, I remember when I was a pastor in Gloucester, Massachusetts, there was a guy in the church from Maine. And, uh, you know, people in northern New England sort of look down on southern New Englanders as like kind of weak and, and soft you know, because as they say in Maine, they they have two seasons. One season is uh, winter. They have winter, and they have getting ready for winter. And when you're from Maine, you're either in winter or getting ready for it. And so there's a kind of a toughness and a stoicness. And 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 he used to say, you know, he's like, I don't know why anybody wants to go to Florida. He's like, I I've been to Florida. I hate swimming in the ocean in Florida. It's like taking a bath. And warm water is, ugh, he's like, it's not refreshing. He's like, I like it bracing. I like to swim in Maine, where the North Atlantic can kind of wake you up. I was too ashamed to tell him that I could barely stand the temperature of the water in Massachusetts. I just, I just did a lot of listening. Um, but we, too, need a bracing word at times to shake us out of our reverie, to shake us out of our slumber, to say something important is happening. This is a big moment. Yes, so-and-so is the president, and so-and-so is your governor, and yes, your mayor's over here, and the pastor's over here, and the denominational leaders. But, but God is coming outside of those hierarchies to shake us every single human being regardless of status and to shake them awake and shake them alive in him through the coming ministry of Jesus and the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit that Jesus shares. So may we be shaken awake. May we be shaken out of our comfort zones. May we be shaken in the areas where we're ignoring the well-being of our neighbors uh, around us, in our community, it's so easy to write people off and somehow say, well, they, des you know, they deserve that problem because they've been, um, uh, you know, they, they messed up. They did some things wrong. And we, we, we create these ways to justify pulling back. I don't feel comfortable with their lifestyle. I, they're not living right, and I'm, I don't know if they're into drugs. I don't know what's going on. And now, listen, I'm not saying to be unwise. But I do think we've got to push beyond those. That, that part of repentance is going to be having new eyes for the world around us. 
and how God is going to be calling us to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly towards our neighbor. Will you join with me in prayer? Dear Father, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for sending people like John and other people into our lives who have spoken prophetically and shaken us up a bit in the middle of our comfort zones. And Lord, I pray that you would keep doing that work so that we might bear fruit of genuine repentance, not just a, a church feeling or a, a private uh, sense of renewal, but, but something where our hearts get transformed and it shows up in the way we act. Lord, do that work in us. Prepare us to receive Jesus Christ anew uh, this Easter, to, to, to welcome anew the risen one into our lives. And we will love you and serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.